All right, one of the things that we thought of when we created the Goaties was how can we give a little bit of shine to some of the greatest seasons in Colorado sports history that maybe don't have the, you know, the recognition that they get elsewhere in the country. And so that's why we created the single season DNVR Hall of Fame. And that's what we're talking about here. Some really great seasons to talk about. Of course, got J. Mike, Hank. Rudo on the panel, uh, and we're going to start here with Rudo. We'll talk a little bit about Milan Hayduk. Yeah, 0203 Milan Hayduk. There are three seasons in Avalanche history that include a 50 goal scorer. They are Joe Sackick, Joe Sackick, and Milan Hayduk. <laughs> 50 goals in 03. He ends up winning the Rocket Richard Trophy for the biggest goal scorer in the NHL. This was the, the peak performance of a guy who is really an avalanche legend, but is not quite on the level nationally that a Joe Sackick or a Peter Forsberg is. So it, it deserves recognition. He had a 98-point year, has arguably one of the most underrated wrist shots in the league, I believe. Yeah, it's not Joe Sackick level, but it's <laughs> not that far off. So someone like Hayduk deserves to get into this conversation from his pure ability. He was never the strongest guy. He was never the most physical. He wasn't going to torch you with his skates all that often. But he was so, so good at the things that he did that he deserves to be in this conversation of the Hall of Fame, just like he's up in the rafters of the ball arena. I love, I love this uh, for this category because it, it's not Joe Sackick or Peter Forsberg or Patrick Waugh. It is kind of a guy who I would say had like quiet production. Yep. Um, those who maybe weren't big Avs fans would have been shocked to see those type of numbers uh, that he put up. And that's exactly like why this exists is to give shine to a season like that that was so prolific and maybe doesn't get mentioned that much. Yeah, and you know, it goes right along with Hayduk himself. He was a fairly quiet guy, yep. not, not a guy that was super boastful. Like, everyone will remember his one ridiculous goal celebration in <laughs> overtime where he dove and swum on the ice, stuff like that. <laughs> but that was far from the norm for, for Hayduk. So it just he came here not too long ago, talked with us here on the set. He's a super awesome dude. He deserves all the recognition in the world. So a year like that, how can you not love it? I will say, and, and Rudo could probably speak to this much better than myself, but I'm 26. So I got to experience Forsberg and, and Joe Sackick when they were good, but I was young when they were like at their absolute peak. So yeah. while like my first sports memory ever is game seven, 2001, it was on my birthday, my sixth birthday, they win the cup, which is pretty cool in hindsight. Yeah. At the time I didn't really care, but <laughs> you know, now thinking back, that's pretty cool. But a guy like Milan Hayduk, that O2 season, that's when I really started to like get into sports. And, you know, I'm watching not necessarily just with my parents, you know, I'm watching it by myself and Milan was my favorite Av and he was just such a gifted goal scorer and yep. again you know I, I know he wasn't necessarily quite as dominant as some of those other guys but especially from that like 2002 to like 2004 which is really when I kind of fell in love with hockey yep. and kind of feels like that miss window where the Av should have won that third cup for sure um you know Milan was a big part of that yeah, yeah. and that's the same thing for me obviously we're about the same age but I remember I got my first PlayStation, PlayStation 2, <laughs> Christmas 2003. <laughs> and so I, the, the first game I got was the NHL 03. And I'll never forget the way the commentator said, hey, Duke. <laughs> like, hey, Duke. And it's just like, oh, this is so dope. And that's, that's my memory is him just being dominant in that game. Love All right. That. So he that. needs to get in the Hall of Fame. So kids and future generations aren't going, hey, Duke. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. He had like you a nasty exactly little <laughs> hook check. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. All right. Well, we have uh, a tough task here because we have a lot of players mm -hmm. to talk about. This is the only category where there's no votes. There's no anything. It's just we're putting these people in our Hall of Fame. Uh, <laughs> so we've got a lot to touch on here. I want to move on to another one here. And again, we, we have the task of maybe talking about some players that we don't particularly cover their teams. Mm -hmm. And this is one of them. But this is what makes these kind of seasons special is everyone remembers Ubaldo Jimenez. Mm -hmm. 2010 i said it to you guys right before we uh started the panel here and it was like every time he was on the mound it was a spectacle and that's really the only time i can ever remember something like that from a pitcher in rocky's history it was so dominant it, it's one of those seasons even all these years later that frustrates me that he didn't win the cy young because how many hitters have been punished, you know, for Coors Field and, oh, you mm. know, the juice stats mm. and this and that. And so here comes Ubaldo Jimenez, who's throwing 100 miles per hour and, you know, seven, eight scoreless innings every single night and doing it primarily at Coors Field. And he just, 
I know he fizzled out a little bit at the end yeah. and you know the numbers I think if he just could have stayed stronger for like three more weeks he probably yeah. ends up winning the award but there have not been very many opportunities as a Rockies fan where you could feel like big cocky with your pitcher walking on the mound and when Ubaldo was on the mound it was like all right we got this. Is is there any other pitcher in Rockies history that batters were actually genuinely afraid of? And I'm not just talking about afraid of hitting off of him because that year, his game plan every game was, I'm going to throw the ball as hard as I can, and wherever it goes, that's where it goes. Mm -hmm. He had some yeah. wild thing to him. <laughs> uh, definitely. I mean, you had that Kyle Freeland season most recently yeah. that was, you know, he was in the Cy Young conversation. But that was, you know, tactical pitching, and yep. uh, it was special in that way. This was really intimidation, throw the ball by you. And I think that might be a little bit of the reason why he did tail off late is, you know, he's, Gassed out a little he's bit, throwing yeah. eight <laughs> innings at 100 miles per hour every, every game. Um, but I do remember, you know, he started the All-Star game that year yep. for the National League. I think he struck out the side. Um, it was special in that way. And again, really the only time I ever remember like a pitcher being the focus of the Colorado Rockies. Yeah. Starting the all-star game alone is rare as a Colorado Rocky. Like even their best position players haven't done that that frequently. I know yeah. Nolan racked up some all-star starts at the end there, but you know, I remember being a young Rockies fan and like watching this all-star game and it's the sixth inning and being like, man, is Todd Helton going to get in that bat in this <laughs> game or what? So mm -hmm. that's what was so cool to have, you know, Ubaldo, a Colorado Rocky, right there. starting Center on the stage. mound. Yep. Yeah. It's. I think baseball is an extremely underappreciated sport. Uh, people don't understand how hard it is to make contact with a pitch going that mm -hmm. fast that moves 18 inches yeah. across the plate. Like, it's it's one of the hardest things to do in the entire world, let alone sports. And that's what Ubaldo did. He made every batter have to be able to do that. So yeah, no, mm -hmm. it was it was really fun to watch. The mm -hmm. whole season was really fun to watch, and it's only sad that it wasn't sustainable. Um, but I think the biggest part is your point there about how he didn't get the extra credit for being a course field that makes no sense. Hitters get taken away from mm -hmm. him, and this is just a problem with the narrative around around course field as a whole. The pitchers never get the extra credit, yep. whereas the batters always get docked. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome season for Ubaldo, absolutely deserving of being in this Hall of Fame. All right, let's move on to a couple of the colleges here. And I think the fact that this season keeps coming up is maybe exactly why it has to be in here. It's Trey McBride this year. This has been an absurd journey. I mean, CSU fans know, look, the Steve Adazio area, it sucked. Like, it was just meme after meme and you know being a national embarrassment for special teams miscues and adazio throwing temper tantrums at the podium and just Getting mostly sucked from yeah. the game. <laughs> <laughs> becoming the <laughs> second coach ever ejected for unsportsmanlike penalties but trey mcbride was like this beacon of hope you know this glimmer of talent and what was just a sea of sadness for csu fans and what's insane is like it wasn't a little you know, pity season was like, you know, it was pretty good. And we got to feel great about that. It was one of the best seasons by a college tight end ever. Fifth tight end in college football history to record a thousand yard season. He is CSU's second ever individual award winner. The first ever unanimous all American. I mean, PFF had a, has him as the second highest graded tight end ever. He's just, he's in the conversation for one of the best tight ends to ever suit up. Mm -hmm. And that's really saying something for a, for a mountain West team, you know, that unfortunately didn't experience a whole lot of team success. And I think that, probably is what kind of kept him out of the spotlight before this season. I mean, this guy has been really good his entire career. He was a three-time first-team all-conference selection. 2021 is really where he broke out of his shell. And, you know, kind of like Jokic, who we'll talk about, you know, it was like on a national level, people were like, oh, my God, this Trey McBride guy is just different. And it was a lot of fun. One thing that I would say that, that adds to it, too, for him is – he had something that not a lot of tight ends have, which is like the highlight plays, the one-handed mm -hmm. catches, the behind mm -hmm. him, the trucking guys over and breaking a bunch of tackles. Like that was one thing that I think elevated it and made it easier for him to get into like the Mackey conversation, which of course he ends up winning. Um, is like he he made Sports Center like plays, and he also played well in the bigger games. And he only had two <laughs> touchdowns. That's what's he, which that's. <laughs> all on the coaching staff you know that has nothing to do with trey mcbride's ability it's all scheming and lack of targets in the red zone but he was so dominant on the field he was so you know racking up catches 90 mm -hmm. catches almost 1200 yards 93.4 yards per game 
that even with only two touchdowns, and one of them was on the last play of the entire season on a fake punt, a 70-yard run he rushed for a touchdown, it's, he still won the Mackey. You know, he had one receiving touchdown this year. Uh, McBride, to me, is kind of the opposite of Hayduke in this conversation, right? Hayduke may be underappreciated on incredible teams. McBride is a guy who brought national attention to a program that hadn't had it in a very point, long time, yeah. basically single-handedly saying, look at this team, look at me, let me show you guys just how good football can be up in Fort Collins. And he just does it all, too. I mean, that's the big thing. Like, he gets the big plays, he has eight catches a game, he, he blocks. Like, there's just nothing more that you could ask of him. And when he's out there doing literally everything that a tight end is asked to do at the very highest level, that's what it takes to, to win the Mackey Award at Colorado State. Yep. And I think when we look back on this, there's a very good chance that we'll be able to add that it led to a, him being a first round pick. I, mm -hmm. I sure hope so. I mean, I think at this point, you know, barring injury or something wonky, he's pretty much guaranteed to be a top 50 pick, mm -hmm. very frequently projected as a first round selection. And when you look at his talent, it, it just makes sense. And the last thing I'll just say about Trey McBride is, you know, legacy. I think when you look back at some of the greatest athletes, the most revered ones are the ones that stuck around, that stayed committed. You know, the Elways, the Sackicks of the world, what Jokic is accomplishing now. That was Trey McBride. You know, he didn't go pro early. He didn't transfer out to the SEC when he had, you know, Lane Kiffin in his DMs trying to get him out at Ole Miss. He stayed committed to CSU. Yeah, I said it, Lane. Stay out of our DMs. He stayed. Stay in my DMs. <laughs> <laughs> Love to talk football. I, he can DM me. <laughs> you know, stay away from some of these air raid guys, but... Just an incredible season, really rare player, and a local guy, right? You know, who loves the the local guys more than us here at DNVR? Fort Morgan, homegrown, and he's going to make us all proud at the next level. Team mm -hmm. DNVR athlete. All right, speaking of the colleges, uh, Eric Bieniemy needs a little shine here. Yeah, I mean, Eric Bieniemy, 1990. You, you win a national championship, that, that counts for a bunch. You're unanimous first-team All-American. I mean, you combine those two things, what more could you ask for? Heisman finalist. Heisman finalist, third in Heisman voting. Like, like. Just he did everything. Almost 1,700 rushing yards, 17 touchdowns. Just a just a freakish dominant season for a running back. And in this golden era of Colorado football, like like he is maybe the face of that era. You know, there's a couple other names that you throw out there, but what a career and, and what a Buffalo. Somebody who will be obviously remembered forever. And he is kind of the standard. He is the standard. Him and Rashawn Salam, like these these group of running backs, it's a, a big name forever. Yeah, and to me, what I think really highlights how special this season was for him mm -hmm. is he was the guy. Like, we're so used to these national championship teams being so predicated on the quarterback. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is a different era of football, mm -hmm. but it's easy to forget that Colorado lost their quarterback in Darian Hagan in some of the biggest games of that season – and they still won them. Yep. Uh, you know, Charles Johnson has to come in for Darian Hagan in, in the national championship game. It's like, that's fine. You're just going to keep giving the ball to the enemy. Um, mm -hmm. So that is what makes this so special is he was the player uh, on offense for that team. And, and it didn't really matter what else you were going to do. You couldn't stop him. He had such a unique style of running. When you mm -hmm. go back and watch some of his highlights, like it, it's electric the way that he, you know, he had that little body and he was so shifty and so quick, but he also had the power to finish runs and, you know, get in in the goal line, 17 touchdowns. Um, those are like, those are some of my favorite Colorado highlights to watch. Um, and obviously, you know, now when you see him, it's kind of crazy to imagine that he was like this jittery <laughs> little back, but he was, he was special. Uh, and that season, extremely special. Mm -hmm. And it was a different era. Um, yes. Like you take the added rushing with a grain of salt from that, but also it was a different era in a sense that Colorado on a week to week basis was playing much stiffer competition. So he's, oh yeah, you know, this was the heart of, you know, the big eight, the big 12. Yep. This was not, you know, he's not running for 200 yards, three touchdowns against the university of Arizona. It's mm -hmm. Nebraska, it's Oklahoma, it's Texas. And it's when those programs were at their peak, you know, it's not today's Nebraska, today's Texas. Totally. Yeah. It was, I mean, one after another, just giants uh, all the way up to Notre Dame, you know? So it was, uh, it's a, it's a hell of a season. Definitely one that deserves to be in here. All mm -hmm. right. Well, this one, it's sort of like Trey McBride in that it's come up in several categories here, but this one uh, cannot be ignored, and the Nuggets nominee is the best season in Nuggets history. It's Nikola Jokic last year winning the MVP, uh, as Adam noted on another panel, top 10 season of all time uh, in PER, 
and it was just so special i think for nuggets fans but also just denver to like get on board with this and follow this um truly truly magical season from not at the time unlikely but when you look at the you know the scope of his career an unlikely story Mm -hmm. outside of a championship i would say Nikola Jokic winning the mvp was the most satisfying collective like moment at least in modern denver sports history because all year you know it's Stephen a smith it's all these talking heads going on talking about oh it's steph you know Jokic. he doesn't impact the game and then everyone and i feel like kind of knew because the the deep basketball writers, the people that like actually have a vote and matter so much more than these talking ends, like it's Jokic by a mile. Mm-hmm. But he wins the MVP, and all of Denver gets to be like, "Yes, mm-hmm. this is our guy. Suck it. All of you can kiss our ass. Like he's the best player in the world. We have the trophy now, and you can't argue it. Like it's, it was just such a ratifying moment, and to have that as a in a what's always been a football town is so cool. It's not just that. It's it's the growing a new generation of fans here too, because. Mm-hmm. People like me remember the late 90s Nuggets where it's like... It was tough. I would rather do anything than watch <laughs> this basketball team. And they, they, of course, have had their moments over the years with the Mellow Era and, and a number of different times, but they've never had the player. Mello was supposed to be that guy. He never quite really got there. Jokic got there. And the way basketball works, it just like didn't feel like it was possible. Like, none of that felt like it was possible. I guess baseball can kind of be the same way, but but there's more room for individual accomplishments, I feel like, for the smaller market teams. But, but in the same way, where it just doesn't feel like the Nuggets could ever win a championship. Like, it just doesn't feel like that is possible. When you see Nicole Jokic just go win MVP in Denver for the Nuggets, and it, it doesn't go to one of the Lakers or the Knicks or one of these historical teams... It just feels like the the window is open. Like Jokic has done that. Why can't he win a championship? Why why can't the Nuggets be dominant for the next five seasons? There's just no reason. And not only did he give us that one season that is so great, it just feels like he has opened the door for Nuggets basketball for He's decades. playing even better right now. I mean, yep. one of the things Adam pointed out statistically, he had a top 10 season last year. He's even better this year. So that season mm-hmm. last year is not even top 10. His MVP season. He's taken it to a new level. He was able to win a playoff series against, you know, Damian Lillard in his prime, one of the real killers in the NBA. Mm-hmm. I know that, you know, Blazers team doesn't have a ton of depth, but I mean, the Nuggets They're are out there. Faku. Yeah, it's Faku <laughs> Composito. You know, you don't have Jamal Murray. And for him to even win that playoff series and, and even make it relevant, like that Sun series was disappointing, but it, that was just like, you're playing with house money at that point. You know what I mean? That was all just icing on the cake. Yeah. For me, the biggest part is kind of what you touched on in the beginning. This was like a win for us because mm-hmm. like people in Denver have just been singing the praises of Nikola Jokic and like trying mm-hmm. to get the good word out for so long. And it felt like during the middle of that season that like it was going to be taken away from us because it was way more interesting for all the shows to be talking about why it might not be Jokic. Even though all along it was Jokic, and I think we were validated in the end with the percentage of the votes, but it did feel like it was like this was a triumph. Yeah. In the same way that like Larry Walker making the Hall of Fame was a triumph, it was like Finally. we did it, we yeah. we won. Like <laughs> everyone wised up to what we've known, and and that's special. All right, last one I want to touch on here, uh, last nominee for this year, last inductee for this year mm. uh, is Champ Bailey in 2006. A really really special season. He was a monster. I mean, this was the best season for a cornerback of all time. Like, I just, there's the Darrell, Revis, whatever. But 35 targets all season. First of all, just imagine that. Like, literally not throwing his way. That's basically once a half. Four catches allowed all season. Just insane. In the entire season, and he picks off 10 passes. Yeah. You could not throw his way. Going back, like, I watched all those interceptions. These were the players who were targeted. Randy Moss on Sunday Night Football. The the next season, he'd go on to have 23 touchdowns. Uh, Heinz Ward, the reigning Super Bowl MVP. Anquan Bolden, picked off twice. In his prime, too. Twice, yeah. Chad Johnson, the leader in receiving for the NFL that season, before he's Ocho Cinco, picked off a pass meant for him. And they throw in, like, like, there was one for Frank Gore, too, in the season that he put up almost 1,700 yards. And sure, it's a running back, but, but you just see what he's doing against elite receivers every single week and and that defense just carried that team to the playoffs the offense had no business being there and champ Bailey's just like the the centerpiece of all of this having the best season for a cornerback ever 
is there not like isn't it everyone's dream to be so good at what you do that you basically don't even have to do the job <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> when you only have to stop 35 passes you just got the benefit of the doubt at that yeah, point just yeah. don't throw it over there yeah. you can stay there it's fine well and, and not to bring it back to Pat Sertan but like that's what you know he had in, in a huge feather in his cap this year mm -hmm. when they went up against the Bengals he had 10 coverage snaps against Jamar Chase zero targets Joe Burrow mm -hmm. said, I'm not throwing to my favorite target if Pat Sertan's over there. And, like, that was everyone for Champ Bailey, especially after this season. Because yeah. this was the season that teams were still like, yeah, maybe we're going to try Champ Bailey. Because we have Chad Johnson or Randy Moss mm -hmm. or Anquan Bolden. And after this season, everyone was like, you know what? Just wherever <laughs> he is, look the other way uh, for the whole game. And that's, you know, this was, for me, what I remember about it is when I like where when we were finally ready to say like we definitely won that trade mm -hmm. um, because you you lose uh, this awesome running back mm -hmm. in that trade and it, and it felt scary at the time because Clinton Portis was awesome he was young he was dominant uh, and especially for me being young I like, got his jersey for Christmas five weeks before he got traded uh, to Washington uh, yeah I had a signed <laughs> picture for Christmas that year mm -hmm. um, so that was like really tough to let go of and then Chan Bailey goes and does this and it's like no yeah Right move. We <laughs> That's that the one. thing, though. Like, I was obsessed with Clinton Portis to a point to where that when they traded him, you know, I did not like Champ Bailey. It, obviously, I'd watched him play. I was like, all right, this dude's really good. Like, I'll get over it. But that whole first season, I was kind of like, ah, like, he's good. But, like, he gave up some touchdowns in that first year. got burned a couple times early. And then after that, he just goes on to, like, establish one of the most impressive careers all, of all time. And, and I, I mean, all of us were young at the time. Mm -hmm. The younger you are, the harder it is to, like, appreciate, like, great cornerback yep. play. Totally. You know? So, like, <laughs> I remember feeling the same way. I'm like, oh, but, like, Portis is so dope, but he had so much swag. And, like, he had that crazy, like, 225-yard, four-touchdown game against the Chiefs. And it was His just so hard game, to let go. His last game, it's what got him traded. He, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's the amazing part, too, right? You Maybe you don't appreciate, oh, they never targeted him. You appreciate 10 interceptions. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly what made it, like, so much more palatable. It's like, oh, if you throw over there, you try him more than once in a game, you're going to get you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Between and, that and, and the Pats pick in the playoffs, yeah. like, just such an incredible legacy. Like, probably really untouched in any sports in Denver be until Nikola Jokic. Like, for 15 years, it was... And well, Peyton Manning. Yeah, I guess. Peyton, Peyton Manning. Manning. But, That's, yeah. but, I mean, yeah, it was it was so special in that way, and, and it was something you don't often get from dominant quarterbacks, which cornerbacks, which is a dominant season mm -hmm. where you can actually see it on the stat sheet. And it's crazy because of teams were still afraid of him, and he still was able to put up those stats. And like I said, after that, it was pretty much like, D just don't go over there. Four um, catches allowed, ten interceptions. And he was the best tackler on the field. Dumb. So, like, if he did happen to give up catch, you know, it's not like he wasn't going to be giving up any yak. Right. Never missed a tackle. Making all the plays in the run game. And I, I've i made the case that that legacy of Champ Bailey's tackling has so underrated. carried on mm -hmm. through the Broncos. Like, you know, Chris Harris became a great tackler mm -hmm. because of what he learned from Champ Bailey. Unfortunately, I think the chain is kind of broken now because there's not, mm -hmm. there's not necessarily connection there anymore. Um, but that carried on. And, I mean, first ballot Hall of Famer. This gives a you know that help that that season helped that first ballot Hall of Fame a lot. And you bring up Chris Harris, like like it is kind of weird that that the dominant defensive backfield for color or for the uh, Broncos that goes on to win a Super Bowl comes just after he leaves. Mm -hmm. But then you remember that Chris Harris is some undrafted rookie who was brought under Champ Bailey's wing. And not to say Chris Harris couldn't have gone on to be successful without Champ, but as Chris Harrison, he'll say that that was incredibly influential. And yep. so you see Champ's, like you said, just that that line, Trickle that down heritage, effect, yeah. just kind of keep going afterward. And I guess you could probably make the case that it you know, spills over from Chris into Justin, For Justin sure. down to Pat Sertan, mm -hmm. so you can keep that kind of rolling. Um, I love this class. This is an awesome mm -hmm. class for the 2021 uh, DNVR Single Season Hall of Fame. Reminder. Come check us out on Saturday for the live show for the Goaties. It's not just going to be your standard award show where people, you know, stand up there and give out awards. we got a lot of fun games and stuff we're going to be playing, a lot of interactive stuff you can do at the bar. So come check us out uh, for this year's live show, 2021 Goaties, this Saturday. <laughs>